All right. Hi, and welcome to the Business Shower Podcast, a podcast for business owners to shine. I am your girl, Kelly Edwards, and today we are talking with Derek McMichael. Derek, how are you doing today? Hi, Kelly. I'm doing swell. Um, I'm happy to be here. I appreciate the invitation, and I look forward to talking more about uh, uh, small businesses and how it is that uh, you know we can help them shine. Yes, absolutely. So tell our listeners who you are and what you do. Uh, my name is Derek McMichael II. Um, I am the CEO and founder of Loud Music. Um, our company, we help different independent artists uh, start their music career, you know, and we do that through our online digital toolkit and uh, utilizing different uh, exploitations in technology and finding out different ways to help uh, artists uh, start their career using the new uh, exploits and technology that weren't there when the industry was really created, mm-hmm. you know, and, and create a sustainable uh, career without uh, having to give up any ownership of their music. Awesome. And you know what? That is real because I used to be in the music business a long time ago. Um, a long time ago, (laughs) 2011-ish. And I could tell you, it so much has changed. And because I used to do a lot of street team promotion, so a lot of street promotion for my artists. And yeah, it's it's changed a lot. So that's so good that there's someone out there that can help you and help you grow and with today's time because a lot of a lot of the artists they don't realize what happens in the back end. So um okay. So uh tell us tell us how your story shaped you into who you are today. Like what made you get into this industry? Oh wow. Um it's funny that you asked. I feel as though it was always um, at a certain level destined, you know, um, because music's been, uh, it's always been around. Uh, it's always been part of my life uh, for as long as I can remember. Okay. Um, from a very young age, I was already, uh, I learned how to play instruments. And um, I first started in, you know, schools, band, orchestras things like that, learning how to, um, really learning what, what music is, how to read music, how it is that, um, not just how to play music with other people, but, you know, learning how it uh, played a part in my life at a young age. And from there, you know, I, I sadly enough, didn't pursue at the level that I should have, you know, um, at first, because I thought that, um, there wasn't something that was a realistic uh, career. You know, I didn't think it was realistic to go into the music industry and be successful. And um, my heart, but my heart just really called to music still when it was time to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. And I knew I had to um, find experts in the, in the field who could guide me and teach me what to do. Um, otherwise I wasn't going to be successful. So um, at at the age of 18, you know, I I went and found mentors in the industry and I I did that um, by really cold calling. Um, I, I, (laughs) I created a list of different studios and record labels that happen to have their phone numbers on their websites. Mm. And um, I just kept cold calling and sending out emails until um, I got an internship uh, right out of high school. Actually, I was able to get to secure an internship with uh, Harvey Mason, um, Harvey Mason Jr. And wow. his, um, you know, and his record label at the time. And, and it was, a, it was an amazing opportunity getting the chance to um, learn at the, at the underdogs and learn um, from some of the masters in the industry, you know, um, and I, at the time, you know, I was an intern and, I, and it, it, but it led me to, um, to an opportunity as an in-house engineer and producer for different record, um, uh, different record studios and different, um, independent labels, uh, throughout the U S, um, in California and on the East coast, um, in the Washington DC area, and then uh, in the Philadelphia area, you know, um, and uh, freelance for artists and going all the way up, not just up, up in New York, but artists who are across seas, artists in the Dominican Republic, artists who are in Europe and Australia. And um, what ended up happening was uh, a lot of artists, they were asking me how they could start creating a career for themselves, mm-hmm. you know, um, because they saw that I had, 
I was doing it for myself. Yeah. Um, it, I was doing it as a producer, you know, but I was very focused on making sure that any projects I was working on could really do do the best they possibly could, which for a lot of artists was, was really actually making them really, really mad sometimes because I wasn't just thinking about putting the song on Spotify or, mm-hmm. you know, at one point it was just putting it on SoundCloud, right? And it was like, how are you going to monetize on that? Now they have a monetization program, but they didn't have anything like that before. Mm-hmm. Um you know, so, you know, we were booking shows and uh, booking, sh- uh, trying to put tours together and creating merchandise and selling merchandise and creating street teams. And then when, um, when streaming really took over, mm-hmm. you know, that's when everything shifted. It made it where all, all of a sudden, not only, um, not only, uh, could not not only uh could we uh get the music out there to the listeners through like a a soundcloud or a youtube but we could now monetize on it and it was also uh legitimate you know um in the sense of it wasn't considered the underground store anymore you know this is now the mainstream store so you were at the same you were you were considered you know you're on the same shelves now as the a-listers and you're not there's not mm-hmm. the same competition to just be in the store you yeah. know and that changes the game in its in its own way you know yes, it um, does. <laughs> like completely <laughs> yes. completely so what, now that this shift has happened what, what what we realized was a lot of artists were now just missing a lot of the essentials that online businesses in general needed Things like um, being able to actually track the the viewers and the listeners and see who their audience is, but then also you know their website and making sure they still created the merchandise. But now you can get it; you can sell it online now. You don't have yes. to get directly in front of the people with the street team the same way. And COVID nope. has shown how how powerful the digital space actually is. Like I am so grateful for COVID <laughs> because it made a lot of companies and a lot of things think outside the box. Like motor vehicles should have already been everything online, but of course not. But yeah, <laughs> I, I was I'm, happy for it. Well, now we're hitting a point where, you know, I think uh, the people have noticed that the, the laws haven't quite caught up to mm-hmm. Um, you know, the new, the new digital market space. Mm -hmm. So we have, um, we have a lot of industries that, um, you know, legally you actually can't sell certain things online. When it comes to music, you know, there's nothing that you, there, there, there's nothing that you can't really sell online when it comes to your merchandise, your music, nails being attached to things like NFTs and people are selling, um, selling uh their royalties um in the form of uh uh bitcoin and mm-hmm. ethereum and taking uh, uh and taking their cuts in these cryptocurrencies you know these are exploitations that are industry wide exploitations that we don't some other industries don't have the um the benefit to be able to even dabble in yeah. because of legislation you know um and i think with a lot of you know sadly enough uh in the music industry you know i'm saying the word exploitation i'm talking about industry exploitation versus the mm-hmm. art artist exploitation and you know mm-hmm. we've been told that the artists need to be exploited for so long you know, a lot of people still think that they need to go and get a manager. They need to go sign to a label. Um, the reality of it, though, is you can if you can still make more sales bundling your sales with your merchandise than you can without doing it. But people don't want to do it because it doesn't count towards your billboard chart count Mm -hmm. you know because because billboard and the industry has decided to create these regulations these aren't regulations that are legal regulations that actually prevent us as artists from being able to um to succeed these are things that we at a level decided that we don't want to go do because we want to play a game that that we all also know is kind of crippling it's kind of crumbling you know um it was a game that was developed to sell radios and people are not buying radios anymore because we're we're in the streaming industry we're in the streaming age everybody's Um, listening to podcasts exactly so Thinking outside the box, you know, and, uh, you know, I think uh, now is a prime time for any artist who really wants to um, just really get out there, right? Get out there and get out there independently. You know, before it wasn't really possible. Nowadays, you can do it. And 
it's amazing that the independent sector of the music industry, it, it's, it's growing at a tremendous rate. It's currently about 33 it generated about 33% of uh, all of the industry's revenue last year, which was a little over $8 billion. Mm-hmm. And um, for some reason, you know, a lot of people associate the independent sector with like the sector that's not making any money. And it's the, you have to go and sign these labels. Like I said before, that's not actually the truth. Uh, nowadays it's booming more than ever. And it's, it's the highest grossing um, industry uh, right? sector. Well, yeah, the highest grossing sector of the industry oh, is the wow. independent is the independent sector. You know, um, we have over sixty thousand this year. It might be at ninety thousand songs being uploaded to Spotify every day. These are not just songs being pushed by by labels and stuff. These are independents making a name for themselves. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, two things I heard you say. Right. One is from cold calling you got your first internship. So I have to ask you, was, were you naturally the type of person that would just reach out and kind of, you know, cold call, or did you have to push yourself to do that? Oh, I definitely had to push myself to do that. Um, there was honestly, it wasn't, um, it was not, I never, I'd never done cold calls before. Um, I think, yeah, I, I think if I did cold calls before then, it probably the, the the closest thing I had to like a real cold call may have been calling like uh because I was still a teenager and I was 18 at that time so maybe I might have called like m- my previous job to see if they were hiring okay um you know it wasn't like uh let me call you nine times until the until you guys tell me not to ever call again um or until you know the line's been switched or um because <laughs> there were some businesses i called enough time where i called until eventually the the, the number may have just, just changed i wasn't sure if they changed it because of me or because yeah. other people were calling but uh-huh. it's, you know um yeah i never really had the cold call for my business before and um i was really I was really intimidated by the idea of doing it, to be honest. And that's why it was really important that I prepare, prepared as properly as I knew how to, which really meant creating the strongest portfolio I could imagine and um, getting all the references who I could from the music space. I didn't know if the industry took references. I didn't mm-hmm. know if anyone cared about a portfolio. In actuality, I'm not sure if, they ever looked at my portfolio before I got hired. I know they definitely did like after I did because I would reference mm-hmm. certain things on there. Yeah. But beforehand, I wasn't, when I actually got the job, um, I would, when I made the references, there were certain times where I wasn't sure if they really looked at the portfolio for it was just the tenacity, the dedication to the space and wanting to be in the industry that really moved them. It had, um, had them say, hey, uh, you can come on in at the time uh, it's uh, Danny Garcia, an amazing uh, audio engineer. He was uh, running the intern section at the t- uh, sector at the time, and he he's the one who told me I could come on in for an interview, mm-hmm. uh, which I didn't even know how I was going to get there for the interview. The the studio wow. was in Los Angeles, and I was in San Jose, California. It was like five hours away. Wow! Um, <laughs> so so you drove like, okay. down or you flew? Oh no, I drove down. I drove down to um drove down to Los Angeles. My my okay. uncle stayed in the area, so I was able okay. to stay at his place for a minute while um you know I did the, the interview and got on my feet. Um and I'm really grateful to him still for you know providing mm-hmm. that space and that time for me. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm hearing a bunch of things now. So I gotta just step back because <laughs> my my podcast is to, you know, kind of influence the next person. So not only did you make a cold call to get your internship, then you relocated to another part of Los Angeles to take the job. Oh, no, wow. part of California. I wasn't California. even in Los Angeles at the yeah. time. I was, in, I was in the Northern Bay area and I had okay. to go to the Southern area. So, you know, if you're, if you're living on the East Coast, uh, a, a good reference would be moving from about new york to atlanta if you're looking from Ooh. like a geographic skill standpoint okay uh, you know um, far. <laughs> yeah it's a little bit closer far. in california times because the, the roads are a little a little bit more straight you don't have to go through all the hills it's like i said five six hour drive i know it's much longer on the east coast but um you know 
completely new, completely new area for me. And uh, honestly, you know, I, I, full disclosure, you know, the preparation is one of the reasons why I was even able to, to make that relocation as well. Okay. When I was thinking about the, where I, where I could go, you know, I knew I was a broke high school student at the time. Um, not a lot of money. I have to get a job, figure out money. And I knew I would need a little bit of a support system in the meantime, um, when trying to figure everything out. And the only support system I really knew how, how to lean on to was family. Um, and that meant making sure that any studios, which also I didn't realize the difference. I didn't know a big difference even between the studios and the record labels. I mean, I knew the difference between the record label and the studio, but mm -hmm. when I was looking at them online, <laughs> mm -hmm. I didn't know that a lot of studios also called themselves XYZ Records. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of... <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but my list was very long where I thought it was a lot of uh, record labels specifically I was going to, was studios, labels, all of that in the mix. And But I made sure to create a list of um, companies mm -hmm. that were specifically in New York, Philly, Los Angeles. Wow. Um, because... I had family that I thought I may be able to stay with in those areas okay. to help me get on my feet. Okay. So I know that gave me a little bit more confidence with even reaching out and knowing, okay, it's possible for me to relocate. Don't know how long I'll be able to stay with any of this family. Mm -hmm. You know, I was only, I was able to stay with my uncle for about a month. Okay. Um, that's how long he allowed me to stay there for. And, um, but that was the month that, that month was all I needed in order to, you know, uh, learn the Los Angeles area, learn what the real estate was like, mm -hmm. um, and learn, uh, and learn about the business that I was interning at. So that way, when I came back, um, because I actually had to take a little moment after I left my uncle's, um, I had to take a minute to really figure, figure everything mm -hmm. out. So I wasn't expecting to leave when I did leave. Um, um, it made it where I was able to really hit the ground strong when I, when I did come back. Okay. Um, yeah, <laughs> it was, Wow. To all of the uh, business owners or aspiring business owners who are listening to this podcast, you, yes. you just have to know um, sometimes you just have to go for it, you know, yes. and things will, things will show up that will just allow you to be successful and get to uh, get, uh, keep going along that path. You know, sometimes you might not see uh, not, might not see where the road continues to it might be a dark, you know, dark night, stormy night. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, the only roads that don't, my, my old football coach used to say, you know, the only roads that don't, um, have speed bumps are dead ends. Mm. Like <laughs> yeah. that. I like your old football coach. That was really, <laughs> I really like that. That was a good quote. So you, you took a lot of risks and I'm sure it was very scary. Yes, 100%. Okay. Um, so, necessity. yeah, but look where you are now. And we're going to talk a little bit more in detail about, you know, that. Um, but so we all know that being an entrepreneur is a tough road. Um, what do you feel like the hardest part of being an entrepreneur is? Well, that's interesting because I think there's different stages to being an entrepreneur even, you know? So every stage of the journey has its own difficulties. Um, and I think a lot of it goes back to what we were just saying about um, to being willing to take on the risk and um, keep continuing forward, even when you don't see exactly um, the right path. And that doesn't mean, and, you know, being able to also make adjustments when you're not going in the right direction is really important as well. And I think that's hard for a lot of people. It's, it's very, sometimes it's easy to also have tunnel vision and mm -hmm. just keep moving forward uh, once it's become a habit. So, you know, speaking back to what I was talking about phases, starting in the beginning and creating that momentum, deciding that even though you don't know if this is going to succeed or not, uh, knowing that there's going to be judgment whether you've succeeded or not, exactly. you know, and deciding that you don't really, you're not going to worry about any of that. You're going to keep moving forward and then yes. hitting, you know, and then also hitting a point where you, you, you've you gotten momentum, things are going well, and you start realizing the worries that are showing up 
at a certain level may be different. And they're saying, hey, there may be a little slight change in trajectory. And this is your leadership coming into coming into play and the um, intuitiveness from you already in the space and learning how to trust yourself and trust your gut. You know, there's a different level of it that's n- n- um, needed when you have a team. And, you know, it's not just... Uh, uh, specifically you know when you uh when i think when you're in the state of doing freelance work you know a lot of it falls back onto you and your client when things don't go well it's on you it doesn't look good and then it's on your client they didn't get everything done but when you start having a team and people are on payroll and there's expectations that are expected you know um failure hits in a different way um you know especially if you have investors or anything like that um on play um on the team as well so you know i i think the two things in, from my experience, I really think it's the two the two things. It's one, being able to, I think, no, it's one thing. It's trusting yourself. It's being able to move, move that dark in the beginning um, and trusting yourself to keep moving forward. And then, you know, trusting yourself when things, even when things are going right and you might have something slight where you're like, I'm not sure if that's something I should really, you know, trusting yourself that, hey, that thing that's nudging you in the corner is nudging you for, for a reason exactly. and kind of analyzing that and saying, you know what, actually, I think we should do, we might need to make a change here. We might need to make a change there and being, being able to trust yourself through, through making those changes and then also see the growth that happens from making those changes and be happier, right. you know, and, and learning from the experiences when things go wrong, being like, well, you know, I, I did the best I could in those moments. I trusted myself and patting yourself on the back there. Um, I think trusting yourself as a leader is, and as an entrepreneur is very important because that's what puts you in a position of leadership and nobody can really trust the leader who can't trust themselves. Exactly. And that's, that was amazingly said, you know, you have to, instead of looking at it as, you know, a failure, you know, like we don't say failures. We say, this was a lesson that I learned and what could I do better next time? So I, I really like that. Um, okay. So my next question is COVID, did it hurt your business or did it help your business? Mm, COVID definitely helped our business. Um, Tell us, tell us, tell us. (laughs) You know, it's, um, it's, it's hard because it's, it's, it it definitely helped our business. Um, And it helped our business in a way that like, uh, well, the first, first part first, honestly, would be, um, the artists uh, started coming to the studio a whole lot more during COVID. When everything got shut down, everybody was in creative mode. So that put us in a position where we could survey people and start realizing what were the specific issues that a lot of the independents were going through that we mm-hmm. could then um, you know, provide services for uh, through our uh, all-in-one digital toolkit, you know, which uh, you can sign up for for free at loudmusic.io. Um, and it took a very long time to really put together the application itself, you know, but it wasn't as long as it would have been if we weren't in COVID because we were in this COVID, uh, uh, because we're in the middle of COVID and, uh, people's schedules had freed up It put us in a position where we were able to get, uh, dedicated teams in areas where we may not have been able to get dedicated teams, um, during the development of the software. Yeah. Not to mention, you know, there was plenty of funding options that showed up for new uh, businesses that were uh, started really like right before the uh, pandemic. You know, we had created the company, we found the company in 2019, then the pandemic hit in 2020. So we were eligible for a lot of the different funding options that were um, showing up during the pandemic, which, you know, we were able to utilize those options and uh, create a whole application, um, you know. So I, I think COVID really helped our business. Um, there was a lot of struggles that kind of went along the way, like on the personal side for like everybody. So at a certain level, you know, I think there may have been moments that where you know, moments where there was things that would have been really easy to do pre-COVID that just for some reason, we're taking way longer and way harder to do during COVID. Mm-hmm. You know, and I didn't. <laughs> no, so it's like I can't quantify how much that really me- like may have um, messed things up or, or or put things on pause for a moment. Yeah. However, you know, the amount of things that came out of the situation that benefited the company mm-hmm. makes me have to say it ended up have, uh, helping us out versus, um, you know, being a de- detriment to our success. <laughs> yeah. 
Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So here is, I call it the double whammy question. <clears throat> Um, because I ask every guest that come on my show this question. So here it is. So what is the most important thing you learned in your life, right? What was your life like before you learned it? And what was your life like after you learned it? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's, you know, it's interesting because I feel as though I know the answer to your first question, but at the same time, I can't remember my life before knowing it. So I feel like I must also, maybe it's not the right, because I want to say the most important thing was learning, learning, mu- learning how to play music, um, because it's opened up my mind in ways that I don't, I just, there's certain things I may look at that I don't think I would have looked at it that way if it wasn't for music. knowing how to play an instrument, knowing about music and specifically the journey that it's taken me on. You know, now I'm the CEO of a music technology company. It's, uh, music has a tremendous part to do with my life. However, I learned about music at such a young age, I, I really can't answer the second half <laughs> of your question. So I want to, you know, so I want to think of something else as my answer. Um, but mm, I think specifically, it's not, not even specifically music. I think I, when I, when I moved to, um, when I moved to Saratoga, California, um, at 16, that's when I was in Northern California. Mm-hmm. Um, I, um, it was brand, it was brand new to me. I had just moved there from, um, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania and Philly compared to Saratoga moving from, well, and I, and I, at that time I was living in the birds. I was right there on the outskirts of Philly too. I, I was born in the city, moved all around the Philly, but moving so you from, went from cold it's very nice weather. <laughs> cold to very, but not just cold to very nice. I went from, you know, the from East Coast city mentality to Silicon Valley. Mm. And that was mind boggling for me, mm-hmm. um, especially at 16 years old when I'm still just trying to figure out who I am. Who I, am. I think yeah. we all still are always every day trying to grow. So we're always figuring out who we are at a certain level, but that age is, you're really figuring everything out. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I, I, I didn't realize how different um, the United States was just from coast to coast, you know, and that, that was mind blowing, realizing how much, um, and then it, that was, my, that was mind boggling for me. I think what I learned was, um, I, I think I learned just a lot about perspective mm-hmm. and how much uh, how how much you can change your perspective based off of you know, just the, the slightest the slightest things. Um, you know, I, I, a lot of things that we take as facts aren't actually facts. Uh, a lot of it is perspective, mm-hmm. and it's important to try to keep that in mind as much as possible because it puts you in a position where um, when coming up with a solution, um, there may be variables in play that you haven't put in play as variables. You're thinking about them more so as as a fact, as like, this is exactly what it, what it is. And that may be what is holding you back from getting the solutions that you want and, and getting to the vision that you, and, and, and seeing the vision that you want to see and, you know, being able to manifest and, and turn that even into a reality is because you're just thinking certain things that, you know, are really flexible. You know, you're thinking of them as rigid. And that was something that it took me a while to realize that. And as human beings will always be um, fall victim to that mentality at a certain level, you know, but I, I learned that that is, something that uh it it bursted my my bubble just moving from philly to silicon valley um really taught me to look at a lot of life differently Mm -hmm. um and uh, i wish i could summarize that in a way that was just like a very (laughs) nice quotes or something like (laughs) you know like (laughs) no it makes sense it makes sense Uh, it makes sense it really does from what i heard from what you said is you know relocating from north philly to 
to California was very big. It was uh, mind blowing and it was very life changing. Um, so to me, that screams travel. <laughs> yes. See, uh, you know, if you are a native New Jerseyan or Philadelphia, New York, you want to get out and see the world. Like you want to yes. see the world because the world is so beautiful. <laughs> Expand your horizons. Go, expand them. <laughs> you know, learn new things. Be willing to get outside of yes. your comfort zone. Yes. And realize that, you know, there's, we like to say there's two sides to a coin. There is more than two sides to the coin. When you go and you travel, you'll realize that there's multiple different coins. Yes. So, <laughs> It is. <laughs> um, and that's, yeah, I think that's really what expands your horizons. And tr- and it doesn't mean that you have to go cross country or leave this country. But, you know, if you take it step by step, if you haven't left your city, go to the next city. If you exactly. need to, if you need to leave your county, go leave your county. Take, mm-hmm. it, take it step by step. Go figure out where you haven't been. And go explore. Exactly. That was perfectly said. That was perfectly (laughs) said. Okay, so as we wrap up, what is new with your business? Tell us what you guys have going on, what's coming up in the next six months to the next year. You know, this is your time to uh, let everybody know what you have going on. And I'm interested too. (laughs) (laughs) Well, the company, we have a few things going on that... um, I think uh, independent musicians and entrepreneurs would, you know, uh, love to be a part of. One of them is first, uh, we have a few master classes going on where we're teaching uh, different and uh, we're teaching independents how to properly brand themselves, you know, and create okay. uh, a strong uh, pitch deck and get uh, sponsors for their business. Mm-hmm. Um, now, is this, this just for musicians or could, you know, someone else, you know, that may not have a, a business related in the music industry, would they benefit from this as well? Well, I think um, I think if you're outside the music uh, space, you will also benefit from these classes. Okay. Uh, they are geared towards people who are in the music space. However, um, like I said before, there's a lot of things, just business um uh, foundational business tactics that uh, musicians have to do, have to embark on nowadays in order to um, really succeed. Mm-hmm. And because of that, uh, these classes will, there's something that you can gain from these classes, whether you're in the music industry or not. Okay. So uh, especially when it comes to getting sponsors and putting together the right assets to uh, attract sponsors mm-hmm. and um, really close deals with them. I think that that is a class that, you know, all entrepreneurs should really, uh, you know, really join in for. Okay. Um, another opportunity that we have for entrepreneurs specifically is uh, we have uh, our independent artist showcases going on later this year um, where different independent artists uh, specifically right now in the Washington DC area will also have an event happening in the Los Angeles area uh, before the end of the year. But I know uh, uh, coming around uh, September, we have an event uh, in the DC area where we have a list of amazing, amazing partners who have put together an awesome, awesome packages for independent artists uh, who win the, the showcase. And uh, we're doing that, um, uh, what is it, to really showcase different talent in the area because there is there is a lot of amazing talent that's in the area that doesn't yes. have an opportunity to really, you know, show really show showcase their talent. And there's a lot of uh, businesses that would uh, do well being in the, uh, having some sort of connection in the art space. Um, and uh, being able to really connect with these artists who, who really um, back up other things in the art space, which realizes even if you're just something like a, like a coffee shop, if you have, if you've, uh, have uh, connected with the artist and you have the artist supporting the shop, uh, you know, it can do wonders for retail in terms of uh, the, the people who just come in in general, the traffic but then also being able to put together events uh, at the shop itself, uh, little, um, you know, Saturday, little Saturday concerts and things like that. And this is an opportunity for 
businesses to meet these artists, uh, get their brands next to other brands that represent um, art and music and, um, you know, uh, hopefully gain some publicity uh, from the different news and press that we have going on around the events as well. Um, and it's going to be it's going to really be amazing. Uh, a lot of artists who haven't ever been on stage are going to be in a position where they're going to uh, not just be on stage, but be trained beforehand and learn how to what it what it takes to be uh, be a performer and not just uh, a musician or a singer. And the vendors and sponsors and companies are going to be in a position where they're all able to network with each other. Uh, figure out about different business opportunities and ways that they can get into the music space and uh, really create the same type of diehard fans that we have for for musicians for themselves as well. Awesome. So you have a mm-hmm. lot of good, exciting things going on. Yes, um, yes. And I hope our listeners sign up. Um, so with that being said, um, this is your opportunity to promote your business. I want you to, you know, let them know where they can find you at online how they can sign up for the master classes and i'm also going to add it to my show notes as well sure thing yeah you guys you can all um follow us uh, on instagram at loudmusic.io you can also check us out on linkedin um if you look at loudmusic.io on linkedin as well you'll find us there uh all of the links to our classes will be uh, in the link in our bio mm-hmm. so if you go to the link in our bio you'll be able to sign up for the classes as well as um, and sign up for Loud Music as well. If you join Loud Music, you can do that uh, today for free and have access to our digital toolkit, which gives you access to, like I said before, your merchandise, your uh, music specific, well, you have entrepreneur web, uh, web templates. So even if you're just, uh, whether you're a small business in the music space or not, uh, we have awesome templates for you, but we have a lot of music specific templates because they're very, very hard to find. Um, online a lot of things we realized we're focused towards e-commerce so we wanted to help create a hub for them as well as you can join our community of artists and other entrepreneurs um in our community section and you know release some music you know we have a worldwide music distribution as well so you have access to that um if you aren't a musician but you want to uh, create a song and release it, you are more than welcome to still do that. We have plenty of entrepreneurs who have signed up who've released music, um, not trying to be the next music star, but just to release music. So uh, we want to just enable people to uh, have access to this uh, two different record uh, uh, industry standard uh, tool tools in one place. And, uh, you know, we're welcome. We welcome everybody to go on to loudmusic.io and check us out. Okay. Well, thank you so much for being on my show. Do you have any questions for me? I always ask everybody if they have any questions for me. Well, um, <laughs> honestly, I, the only, the only question, um, I, 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 I hmm. well, the biggest question I really have for you is uh, what inspired you to create this space for business owners? And um, before I do that, first I want to say thank you for having me. You know, but um, there's, there, I think there's going to be a lot of business owners who listen to the podcast. And real quick, if there's a reason, if you want to explain why it is that you created this space for them, I would love for you to share that, um, and I'd love to learn more about it, about it myself. Yes. Yeah, so it started as a meme, but. Um, in the back of my head, I felt the same way as the meme. Cause when I, I wrote, when I saw the meme, um, it kind of really resonated with me. So it was a big meme that was going around Facebook. It was just like, instead of having baby showers and bridal showers, why don't we have, um, you know, business showers. And at the time, um, you know, I was having some fertility issues. So I was feeling a little insecure and I'm like, I've started two businesses and no one has celebrated the fact that I started two businesses and I'm proud of myself. So that was the reason I started to, you know, I looked into it. I did my research and I decided to look into what a business shower was. Um, And I had my first one in March, actually March of the pandemic. Um, I haven't had one since, which is kind of, you know, it's kind of scaring me. I might do one soon. Um, But then the podcast came about when the pandemic shut everything down. I was like, well, 
what am I supposed to do now? Like, how can I still create a space for business owners to be able to showcase their business? Ha, the podcast. It just, it kind of like clicked and um, I started the podcast and yeah, that's where we are today. That's amazing. <laughs> that, and I feel like that just speaks so much to um, true entrepreneurship. Mm-hmm. Um, and being able to really create something from anything. You, know, you yeah. saw the meme and you're like, wow, this is amazing. And decided to pursue um, that path for a moment. And now it's a whole podcast. And um, that, is, that is awesome. Yes. Um, I love I love stories like that. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yes. Yep, and it's a flip side to that whole story, but everybody will find out on May first because that's what I'm going to announce. So yeah, just make sure you log into uh, Instagram and Facebook on May first. I got a big, big announcement. Okay, I will be there. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, thank you so much for being on the show again, and until next time, everybody. 